As an analyst, I had gone to conference after conference, and I had heard leader after leader talk about how they had improved operating margin and improved inventory and delivered success on new product innovation. And I wanted to write the book to celebrate our journey. I couldn't do it. As I sat at my kitchen table and I started taking corporate performance data for the 650 companies that I directly worked for, I didn't see any improvement. In fact, what I saw that many companies were going backwards or they were doing what I call circling the drain. And so instead, I wrote a book about the history of supply chain. And that's the book Bricks Matter, and it's for sale here. It wasn't the book I wanted to write, though. I wanted to write the book around how supply chain drives excellence. And when I started writing the book, my editor said to me, could you write the book and never use the word supply chain? I went, really? You know, I'm passionate about supply chain. Never use the word supply chain? She said, supply chain's so boring. <laughs> Nobody's gonna buy this book, right? And I'm like, why have we made this so boring, right? To me, supply chain is about the language of business, right? But as we think about it, and we think about our three-letter acronyms and our four-letter acronyms, and I go into companies that even have a whole Wikipedia of their acronyms, right? We've made it pretty boring. And when companies want to talk supply chain, they want to talk the language of business. And they want to talk about how we're going to improve operating margin and days of inventory and inventory turns and cash-to-cash -cash cycles and return on invested capital. And I find that a lot of people can't do that. They can't pull up the chair at the boardroom and talk about how supply chain does that. So when I think about supply chains, I think about how can I help the average Joe to talk about how supply chain delivers on corporate performance. And that is my second book, which will come out in November. And whether you buy my book or not, it doesn't matter, but I want to tell you about the journey. So when I finished the book, Bricks Matter, I started off and started working with clients, and I ran into a guy by the name of Joe. Joe works at a big company, and he asked me to come and talk at his annual kickoff meeting. He had invited supply chain leaders from around the world, and on the whiteboard was 77. We didn't know what 77 meant, so we got our coffee, and we started out the day, and it was Joe's big, hairy, audacious goal, right? He was so proud of his BHAG, and he started talking about this was his new inventory target for the year. Reduced inventory by seven days, right? And people in the room were very nervous because they weren't great at planning. And the last time they took inventories down, they had really caused a detrimental effect on fill rates, right? But Joe's talking about inventory in 77. And I took Joe to the side and I said, how do you know that's the right target? And how do you know how inventory affects case fill rate and cost? And do you know the potential of your supply chain? Now, this is a vice president of supply chain. And he said, well, how would I know that, right? And so network modeling, network design, design of inventory. And he's like, I don't know how to do that, Laura. So my new book is called Metrics That Matter. And what I'm trying to do is to help people like Joe to look at our metrics cannot be looked at in isolation. I can't take an inventory number and pluck it as a goal without looking at all of my metrics. I must manage it as a system. And as I look at companies across the last decade, because we've invested 1.7% of revenue into IT, we really got to come to grips with nine out of 10 companies are stuck at that intersection of case fill rate, operating margin, and inventory. The technologies that we have implemented in the last decade really now are legacy. 
And we're starting to see the definition of new forms of technology to redefine planning. And I'm very bullish about what LamaSoft is doing. I want you to help them to do it even faster. I want you to help people within your organization to understand the potential of tools like this. And it's for this reason I've written the book. So as we think about supply chain excellence, many people think, well, I know what excellence is. And I'm going to say, I think you're going to think about it far differently when I finish my talk today. Because most people begin the journey on metrics with looking at it at a project basis, right? People assume that if I have a return on investment for every project, and I do a project here, and I do a project there, and I do a project here, that soon excellence is going to happen. And a project-based approach gets you into trouble. The second thing people assume is, I've got functions, and I'll just do best functions, and I have best in class in procurement, and I'll have best in class in transportation, and best in class in manufacturing, and wonderful things happen. Not true. For true supply chain excellence, you've got to set a framework so that you can make trade-offs between source, make, and deliver against an operating strategy. Other people think, well, I'll just open up a box of software, insert a CD, and have some consultants come on a bus that I've got best practices. I don't believe so. I think you've got to design the operating strategy and then implement your practices aligning with metrics that recognize this complex system that are aligned. And alignment is tough. That's what my book's about. That are balanced, and balance is tough too. You know, Kaplan wrote the book about the balanced scorecard, but when I do research about what balance means, I don't get a good answer. So the book defines alignment, and balance, and resiliency. And I believe that the project and the functional approach really have to be thrown away. For us to think about outside-in supply chain excellence and what this means in the progression of how we adopt metrics. So today I want to tell you about how I started, the vision, about my reflections at the end of writing the first book. And then I want to talk about the current research that we've been doing, because it's been a two-year research project, and I've learned an awful lot. And then I want to talk about what we are doing on the Supply Chain Index, which is a measurement of how you can look at supply chain improvement. Because I think people need a measuring stick of how they're doing and how they compare against peer group. And I don't think you can put all companies in a spreadsheet and shake them up. I think you've got to really compare progress against an industry peer group. And then I'll tell you a little bit about why I think network design matters. And then I'm going to wrap up, and Toby's going to come up and hopefully not ask me too hard a question. So let's start. So I do research. I do 20 quantitative surveys a year. They're open research. You give to me, I give to you. And how do I do that? Well, I do research studies in social, so you'll see me on LinkedIn inviting people to participate. You'll see me on Twitter. Sometimes I'll do an email campaign. And when I ask you to work with me on a research project, I always keep your name in confidence, and I keep your company in confidence, and I report the findings on my blog and in reports, and I actually have 55 reports. And instead of locking them behind a firewall and making you pay for the research, I give it all away for free. So you give to me and I give to you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of the research tells me. So the first piece of research says, when I ask people about the metaphors of today's supply chain, how would you describe it? The first thing is room for improvement. They're not happy. And you know, current technologies aren't going to get us where we need to go, right? And that's what I'm doing a lot of writing about. We are at a juncture of what I call the third act. The first act was best of breed. It was when we were arguing about client server and the evolution of 32-bit to 64-bit architectures, and that was the first act. The second act was we believed that we could get this integrated ERP system and we would be able to get tight integration and planning, and that was going to deliver better results. Well, my research now says that 
We didn't do so well on that act, right? And you want to look at the return on investment, come to my website. But the third act is around the redefinition of planning. And it's about the digital supply chain, and it's about cognitive learning, and it's about active design of the supply chain. And I'm excited. It's so much fun. And I really love when I have people like you in the audience to be able to do some of the foundational work because I believe supply chain matters. I really believe it's the core of the comp company and I believe it saves the world. So the first thing is we have room for improvement. Second thing is we're really active, right? We're not agile and we've got to design the supply chain to be agile. My research says that you've got to make a choice between the efficient supply chain, which is the lowest cost per unit, the agile supply chain, which says, do you have the same cost, quality, and customer service given a level of demand and supply volatility, and the responsive supply chain, which is all about cycles. There's a need for all three of the designs, but it has to be conscious. And what I find most leaders are not doing is conscious choice. So the first thing I want you to learn from Laura today is there's room for improvement. The second thing is supply chains today as we have them designed are a risk, right? So when you look at this chart and you look at where we are today versus five years from now, and you see these bubbles which represent from the survey where the largest issues are, demand volatility is a major risk. And we're asking the wrong questions. We're asking how do we reduce demand error? The question we should ask is how do we model demand volatility? The traditional demand management techniques are not satisfactory for where we are today. The second issue you'll notice is the management of global operations. We were naive about the design of planning systems because we didn't design local global governance, right? We didn't really design what would be the role of the regions, what is the role of global, and how do we actually bring design into planning and execute in global economies. We're on the evolution to do that. You'll notice we've solved some of our supply chain visibility problems, and the evolution of business-to-business -business networks is quite exciting. But demand volatility and global operations lay ahead of us. So when we look at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns for my first book, I wanted to say, how had we done? So I hired a research analyst from a local master's program, and we looked at all of the performance of the public companies within Morningstar sectors to say, if we look at companies and we look over the period of time, how many companies were able to make progress for two years at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns? And how many companies were able to make progress for three years? And how many companies were able to make progress on and on? What you see is the progress is short term, right? We do a project, we're really proud of it, everybody gets the t-shirt, you know, we do the high fives. You've been there, I've got a whole closet of t-shirts. But the projects are not sustainable. They don't tie us to corporate performance. And what I think we don't understand when we implement those projects is that the supply chain is a complex system, right? I'm a chemical engineer, gotta admit, didn't sit on the front row of complex system theory, but the supply chain is a complex system, and it has complex processes with increasing complexity. And what I found out through my research is the relationship between the metrics is nonlinear. And we've been trying to apply linear optimization techniques to optimize a nonlinear function. And so my first model looked like this. You know, I said, was it resilient? Was it predictable, right? I wanted to find out the companies that were. I wanted to say, is it balanced across the metrics? And I wanted to say, is it showing year over year improvement? Because I believe this was the definition of supply chain excellence. So in my first book, I built a model that looked like this, that said supply chain leaders are trying to drive profitable growth, and they balance revenue or volume with cost, they balance working capital, 
They have new corporate social responsibility goals. They have to trade off assets. And then at this planning level, we've got forecast accuracy and customer service and inventory. And that's really where our tools have been connecting. So when I first started to do this modeling, I said, could I look at what we had done in these areas over the last decade? I can't find good data for forecast accuracy. The APQC data is self-reported, and self-reported data and forecasting is worthless. Everyone has different hierarchies. The way we report it has to be standardized. The case fill rate, I find people have bias, right? I find case fill rate is a lot like me reporting my weight on my driver's license next week. It's like, yeah, am I going to say what I really weigh, or am I going to say what I weigh six months from now? There's a positive bias. People overstate their case fill rate. And it's often self-reported. So I had to abandon this model to do my modeling of what I'm going to call the effective frontier because I couldn't find good data for forecast accuracy, I couldn't find good data for case fill rate, and I couldn't find good data for corporate social responsibility. So I said, could I take corporate performance data? Could I take 10Ks and could I take publicly held information data and look at my complex system differently? Could I look at progress of companies over the last 12 years for growth, for profitability, for cycles, inventory turns, cash to cash, and complexity? And could I take balance sheet metrics and start to look at what had we really done? What was the litmus test of the supply chain? I find now nine out of 10 companies are stuck, and the reason they're stuck is because complexity has increased, and we've not been able to balance operating margin, inventory turns, case fill rate, along with growth. And I think a lot of it comes to our project-based approach, the false belief we have best practices, and the lack of design and the ability to really manage the effective frontier. So in my book, my new book, I talk about how we raise the potential of the frontier, how we bring things like design to play, how we bring things like new technologies, new business processes to play, and I actually give a framework for people to think about supply chain excellence. When you look at this chart, the first thing you see, it's an eye chart, right? And Toby's going to have the slides so you can look at it as a follow-up. But what I found when I went through all of the industries, across all industries, we had improved revenue per employee through the investment of the last decade. So you can see all industries are showing an improvement in revenue per employee, and where we have very global and large industries like consumer packaged goods and chemical, where we've got a lot of intense asset base, we really improved revenue per employee to a greater degree than an industry like we did in retail. But if you look closer, if you're closer to the side, you can see that operating margin and inventory turn on average, we're stuck. We're not making compelling results there. We've increased sales cost on SG&A and a lot of industries, and we've proliferated product platforms without really managing the complex system. Now, if we look in aggregate at all industries over time, what we see is at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns, when there's a recession, about a year after the recession, in aggregate, companies will do much better in making inventory turn and operating margin improvement. But you'll also see as we move out to the current state, post the 2007 recession, we're starting to slide again, not able to make those improvements. We're getting a little bit more lax. And I think it's because we don't really have a clear understanding of the metrics that matter, the interrelationships of the balance sheet, and how that ties to supply chain performance. The other thing I think that we don't have clarity on is back when I used to run factories, we had two buffers in the supply chain. We had manufacturing and we had inventory. We've given up a lot of our manufacturing buffer with outsourced manufacturing or our assets are being sweated to such an extreme, we no longer have that as a buffer. 
And we have inventory technologies that really look at inventory levels. In other words, how much inventory should I have in the operational planning space? Where I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve the potential of the supply chain is really looking at form of inventory. Should I hold in a raw material, a semi-finished good, or a finished good? And function of inventory, is it promotional stock, seasonal stock, cycle stock? and the impact of the design on inventory as a buffer. It's one of the reasons why I'm very excited about what Llamasoft is doing and their inventory projects. And a lot of the companies that I see that are doing great things on what I call the effective frontier are bringing design of supply chains monthly into SNOP to be able to look at volume to cost trade-offs and the design of buffers. And so I think our language and our processes have to change in this new environment. So let's talk about the history of the work. Why do I say this, right? So after I started my work on the book Bricks Matter, I felt that I needed to build a database of corporate performance. So I took 20 years of history and I looked at supply chain financial ratios. And the reason I did financial ratios versus absolute numbers was it allowed me to compare small companies to big companies, allowed me to do cross-continent comparisons so I didn't have to worry about currency, and it allowed me to look at aggregate trends. So I looked at which of these metrics correlated to market capitalization, and we did a lot of work around what I'm gonna show you with orbit charts. And we decided for building what I'm gonna call the index was I would pick growth, year-over-year -year growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital to start doing the modeling about which companies were outperforming their peer group and why. So to come up with those metrics, I took six years of market cap data, the number of shares outstanding by the share price, and I looked at the correlation of different metrics to market cap data and at first I wanted to find predictive models that would basically take these ratios and put them into a predictive model to predict market capitalization. I was able to do that in consumer packaged goods and medical device industries, but not in other industries. And as I got into intense work with Arizona State University, I really came to understand just how nonlinear these relationships were. But I can see the correlation in most industries for return on invested capital, inventory turns, and operating margin. So I built those into the index. Now, you may look at this chart and go, whoa, that looks like modern art, right? This is very characteristic of how companies are performing at the intersections of metrics on the effective frontier. And in fact, revenue per employee is much linear, more linear than operating margin and inventory turns views. So let me explain how you look at these charts. Because these charts are the basis of what I'm gonna talk about on the supply chain index. This is an orbit chart. It contrasts two supply chain ratios. In this case, it's revenue per employee and inventory turns, and it's for a company, Dow Chemical, publicly held information off their balance sheet. And it tracks year over year, so the dots represent year over year improvement or lack of improvement against the best state, which is in the upper corner, which says that if I'm doing things well, I'll take these two metrics and make progressive improvement. And the center, I have the averages, right? So I did charts like this for 2,000 companies. I asked them what were their peer groups, and I started looking at the intersection of these metrics. And I also started mapping value chains, right? This is consumer packaged goods. Now there are three things I want you to learn from this chart. One, no company on this chart, right? So Walmart is on this chart. They're up in the top corner. They're the little black box, right? They're not making a lot of progress, right? Walmart's on this chart, VF, Corp is the green, they're apparel leader, they're at the bottom of the chart. Hershey's on the chart. BASF is on the chart as chemical. And Colgate is on the chart. No company on this chart is making a linear progression towards the goal. All of the companies have some variation. 
I'm going to tell you that the companies on this chart are leaders, and there's a lot less variation here than what you're going to see in other charts I'm going to show you. So not making linear progress to the goal. The second thing is, each of the companies is operating in its own plane or its own effective frontier. And the third thing is, we've said that we've made progress in this value chain through all our collaborative processes like vendor managed inventory and retail scorecards. But in aggregate, we have not reduced the inventory levels or operating margin of this industry. And this industry is further along in collaborative processes. And one of the reasons is, is because we've been very enterprise centric and we've pushed cost and waste backwards in the supply chain. We've said we're going to do vendor managed inventory, but we haven't necessarily shared data, but we've pushed that inventory back. We've said we're going to collaborate, but what we've really done is we've increased payables by 30 to 45 days. And what that does is it actually shows up an operating margin in about 48 months post that movement. So we've said we're going to collaborate, but we really haven't. These are the leaders. They're not really making that progress against the goal. And everyone is moving on their own plane. So I wanted to come up with a methodology that would help supply chain leaders to be able to talk to the board level about this problem. And one of the first things that I ask Dr. Runger at Arizona State University is, I've got all these orbit charts. You know, I've got 2,000 orbit charts. Is there a way I could measure the resiliency of supply chains at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns? Because I believe a tight pattern with progressive movement towards the goal makes sense. So we started measuring the mean distance between the points. And we looked at all of the industries. And these are stacked ranked. So the medical device industry has very tight patterns, very resilient, but they're not making much movement. Consumer packaged goods is resilient and strong. But down at the bottom with contract manufacturers and also with third party logistics, we have a lot of wild swings. We're introducing risk into the supply chain because we've not improved the signal to them and we've not actually designed the supply chain for outsourced manufacturing. So I wanted to come up with a methodology that could look at, could I take balance at the intersection of growth and return on invested capital? Could I take operating margin and inventory turns in the intersection? And could I take resiliency and apply that to publicly held data to allow supply chain leaders like you to change your peer groups and to change your time periods and to look at are you making improvement? It's a measurement of improvement, which I call the supply chain index. I publish this on SlideShare. It's available for everyone. And if you'd like to know how you're doing against a peer group, I'd be glad to share that data with you. And it's like running a triathlon, right? I am in the system calculating the balance factor then I'm waiting who's doing the best at the intersection of growth and return on invested capital. Then I'm calculating the strength factor of who's doing the best at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turn, stack ranking. And then I'm ranking the resiliency factor of how tight is the pattern. And I'm trading off with 30% on balance, growth and return on invested capital, 30% on operating margin and inventory turns, and 30% on resiliency. And in August, I'll ask supply chain leaders to come in and give their peer feedback, which will count for 10%. Let's look at the industries. This is consumer packaged goods, right? Now, one of my big surprises is I always held that Procter & Gamble, Toyota, Amazon were supply chain leaders. But in doing this work, what I'm seeing is that Procter & Gamble is actually not making a lot of improvement. You can see they're at the bottom if you're close enough. And we'll show the slides to you later if you're in the back part of the room. Colgate is actually outperforming Procter & Gamble. They've got 42 consecutive quarters of operating margin, and they've got some of the best return on invested capital in this industry. 
However, they're stuck on inventory, and one of the reasons why I recommended that they use Llamasoft was to help them to reach better balance in metrics. There's a little company called Beiersdorf. The beauty category is doing well because of high growth rates, and there's a little company named Beiersdorf here who's actually a supply chain leader making its way up the charts. Daniel Weber, who leads that company, actually went to the board and said, I know you don't care about inventory, but I'm gonna tell you the high levels of inventory we're carrying are actually detrimental to us being able to drive customer service. So I want to reduce inventory and improve customer service through network design, through form and function of inventory, and he is rising on the charts, right? So when you look at the orbit charts underneath this, right, this is Procter & Gamble versus Colgate. Again, you don't see linear progress, right? These are supply chain leaders. Procter & Gamble's going backward in operating margin, heavily driven by complexity, and I also think because of lack of good network design into SNOP and into form and function of inventory, and really being able to embrace complexity with operating margin. Colgate, it's 10 days unfavorable on inventory. They're also out of balance because they've been so focused on return on invested capital and operating margin that they're not able to drive balance and alignment. Here's Unilever versus Procter & Gamble. Pierre Luigi has done some great things at Unilever in the last five years. He is making more progress than Giannis is at Procter & Gamble. But again, these are not straight linear lines like we projected back when I was selling supply chain solutions. Let's look at food and beverage. I'm gonna take you through a couple of industries and what you're gonna see over the summer is I will publish every industry and I'll, I will give this methodology to all supply chain leaders to judge improvement. And again, this is a lot like The Biggest Loser, right? If you ever watched the show. The, guy who's the heaviest can lose the most, right, in my methodology. Here's food and beverage. A shining example of driving supply chain improvement is Hershey, right? Hershey has done incredible work on return on invested capital and inventory, the work that Jason Ryman has done. Campbell's has been very resilient and has not driven the improvement of Hershey, but here we have food and beverage, much more volatile industry than CPG. The methodologies for CPG don't work so well in food and beverage because of the commodity markets and the need for what I call demand orchestration or market-to-market -market signals in sales and operations planning. General Mills has greatly outperformed Kellogg's. General Mills is better at planning. They implemented ERP once and first time right, and Kellogg's is still struggling to get ERP to work. They also really are good at design. Now, when you look at their patterns, you can see they're really messy patterns, but the average is General Mills outperforms Kellogg. Chemical. Watch BASF and my numbers. BASF is 110 billion moving up the charts, right? The work Robert Blackburn has done on metrics on his dashboard, the adoption of cognitive learning, he is dramatically outperforming DuPont. Look at the resiliency factor here with DuPont. See how that line is all over the place at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turn? BASF had a tough time through the recession and then they straightened out. So what would I like you to learn from this? We aren't making linear progress. It's a system, it's complex. I want to give you a methodology to help you measure improvement. I used to work in Gartner. I don't believe in the Gartner Top 25. It's too limited, right? It only looks at a few companies and it becomes a beauty contest because it's 50% opinion. I think supply chain is too important to be opinion-based. I think it needs to be about the metrics that matter. And we need to hold vendors accountable, we need to hold consultants accountable, and we need to hold ourselves accountable to drive supply chain improvement. I also think that the design of the supply chain is important. The companies that are moving up the index the fastest are companies that I see are doing great things in design. So we did a recent study on network design when many of you may have participated. And what we find is that most companies are starting to aggregate groups for network design. And it's no longer ad hoc like I used to be in the back room with a friend of mine trying to get models to run. 
And in fact, we're starting to see teams of people to be created for modeling competency. On average, I see that it takes at least three to four years for organizations to learn modeling competency. But even more importantly, I see it takes five to six years for executives to understand that the design of the supply chain into the tactical process is important. The barrier with executives understanding the supply chain as a system is something that you really need to help them with. The other thing I see is that about 30% of companies have a supply chain center of excellence. Only 50% of companies feel that they do it well. And one of the issues is people aren't clear on the definition of supply chain excellence. I want to help. I want to help people to understand that these tools just shouldn't be used for physical modeling. It isn't just about which truck should win when and which DC should be where and which manufacturing plant should be where. Instead, it needs to be about flows. It needs to be about push-pull decoupling points. It needs to be about what-if analysis. It needs to be about volume to variability to cost and to look at profitability. And you can see that most of the modeling that you're doing today is very much about physical. And I want you to move it to help companies to balance the effective frontier and to improve the potential. I'm glad to see that we're doing modeling more frequently. I actually believe we should model the supply chain at least monthly as part of the SNOP process. And we're starting to see that the modeling is becoming more frequent. But there's a shortage of planners. The average planning position is open five to six months. And so as we think about talent development and we think about building the organization that manages the important as well as the urgent, modeling and these design concepts are a change management issue. So in closing, I want to thank you for having me here. I want you to leave here with a couple of things really clear in your mind. Supply chains are 30 years old. We've gone through two evolutions of supply chain planning. We're poised for the third act. The technologies we have today are not sufficient. Nine out of 10 companies are stuck. They don't know they're stuck. They don't know what to do when they see my crazy charts. I want to give you a methodology to help you to be able to measure against peer group. The second thing is, while aggregate resiliency is improving across the supply chain, we have issues around the management of value networks that we really need to embrace because it's a risk factor. And then if you look at how do you improve the potential, how do you get on the scale and the biggest loser contest and move yourself up the stack, I think it's about network design. It's about embracing new technologies. It's about understanding the supply chain as a system. And I want to help you in that journey, because I believe supply chains improve corporate performance. They save the world. And I don't think it's boring.